very warm welcome to the new episode of Ink and Insights. This is your host Sumit Sarma Samir. This is a Nepal-based podcast, but if you are interested in listening to global thought leaders from around the world, please subscribe to my channel. I'm extremely delighted to welcome Nobel Prize winner Sir Richard J. Roberts in my program today. Sir Roberts is a prominent scientist who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1993 along with Philip A. Sarp for the discoveries regarding the genetic regulation of RNA splicing. Richard J. Roberts was born on September 6, 1943 in Dev Derby, England. He attended the University of Sheffield, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry in 1965. He then pursued his doctoral studies at the University of Sheffield and completed his PhD in Organic Chemistry in 1968. After completing his PhD, Roberts moved to the United States to work as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. His research interests shifted towards molecular biology and he began working on the newly discovered enzymes called restriction enzymes. In 1972, Roberts, along with his colleague Philippe Sarp, made the groundbreaking discovery that genes in DNA are often interrupted by non-coding sequences, which are later removed during the process of RNA splicing. This discovery laid the foundation for understanding gene expression and regulation. Their work revolutionized molecular biology and had significant implications for understanding genetic diseases, gene therapy, and the development of new drugs. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Roberts has received numerous awards and honors for his contributions to science, including the Royal Medal from the Royal Society of London, the Lausia Gross Harvey's Prize from Columbia University, and the Gardiner Foundation International Award among others. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Sir Richard J. Roberts is known for his dedication to science and his ad advocacy for scientific integrity and openness. He has been outspoken on various issues related to science policy, including the importance of funding basic research in the need for transparency in scientific publications. His work continues to inspire researchers in their quest to unravel the mysteries of the genetic code. It's an immense pleasure to welcome Sir Roberts in my program today. Professor Robert, thank you so much for your time and I'm really honored. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure, but just call me Rich. I, I don't like too much formality. <laughs> thank you. Rich, um, let me begin by asking, what do you enjoy most about being a scientist and what keeps you motivated to continue your research? Well, you know, science is my hobby. I love it. Um, I don't really think I've worked a day in my life I just enjoy everything I do. And the, see, the key secret to science is just making discoveries, seeing things that people haven't seen before, um, thinking of new ways to do things, to try to solve problems. And it's great. You can't beat it. Right, right. Um, you know, I have, uh, you know, in the preparation of uh, this particular interview, I went to a couple of your videos and then I came to understand that you give a lot of importance to luck in uh, individual's life. Uh, is that anti-science? Oh, not at all. Everybody has luck. You know, I, I think if you look back on your own life and say, you know, why did I do this? Why did I do that? Sometimes it was deliberate, but lots of times you did something because it was luck. Right. And I think almost every really big discovery, you know, you don't go out looking for the discovery. You're usually working on something else. Things don't work out. You look to see why things haven't worked out. And then you discover that nature was trying to tell you something that it doesn't operate the way you thought it did. And, you know, if the discovery is big enough, you're lucky and get a Nobel Prize for it. Right. Right. And uh, as a molecular biologist, can you please tell us something about, you know, physiology of human life? I mean, it's always interesting to understand, uh, to get to know what, I mean, how did we come into this uh, the way we are today? Well, you know, I my field of study is bacteria, not humans. I find humans way too complicated for me to hope to understand personally. Right. But, you know, the great thing about biology is we have this wonderful explanation for why everything is present on Earth that's living. It's called evolution. And the very first organisms didn't look very much like you or I. They look much like the bacteria that I study every day. They were very simple organisms. And they slowly figured out how to make themselves more complicated. And sometimes they would join together and you would get multicellular organisms. And eventually um, we got to man. Right. 
and uh, in the process uh, i think it seems that uh, there are a lot of evolution that has taken place simultaneously as well in this larger society oh absolutely yeah well i mean you know if you just look at what happens in the seas we're pretty certain that the original life um, originated in the seas maybe around the hot vents um, that come up and then animals figured or the organisms living in the sea figured out how to get out onto land then a lot of different evolutionary events took place um, so you know eventually we ended up with something that looked like us um, in Africa and the initial um, prototypes of us were really gorillas or, or something along those lines and then we started to develop and got a brain um, I'm not sure we've always used it as well as we should um, but nevertheless that led to a lot of important possibilities for mankind yeah yeah and I think it's all the cognitive revolution that seems to have sort of facilitated this uh, process uh, uh, of our evolution uh, where we stand today and looking at the um, this process do you feel uh, that there is still a space wherein we could evolve further oh absolutely evolution never stops so absolutely but whether we will evolve for the better or for the worse that i wouldn't like to predict you know, at the moment evolution is leading into artificial intelligence um, and i think we don't really know where that is going to go yet but i think it is something we need to think about very carefully and uh, need to control, make sure that we control it, that we don't just let um, rogue players run astray with it. Exactly. So you, your work is more with the uh, bacteria, and, can you, and uh, can you please tell us human relationships with bacteria? How does uh, it really help each other? Absolutely. Well, you know, the first thing is bacteria got a very bad name because the microbiologists started by studying all the pathogens. They started looking at the bacteria that cause disease. And that left a general impression with the public that all bacteria were bad. The bacteria basically are pathogens trying to kill us. And that's exactly the opposite of the truth. The truth is that without bacteria, we could not live. The bacteria that live with us are very important in keeping us alive. And they don't want us to die. In fact, they often have found ways themselves to kill the pathogens that otherwise might come along and kill us. And so it's this underlying microbiome, we call it, which are all the bacteria that live with us on our skin, in our guts, in our mouth, everywhere. These are the organisms that are really important for keeping us alive. And I'm very interested in understanding how they work and there's one very interesting fact, you know, the brain has more nerve connections to the stomach than to any other organ in, in our body. And so the bacteria that live in our gut, they're talking to our brain because there are so many nervous connections. And I want to know what they're saying. I think that would be very interesting to find out how this communication takes place. And we already have some evidence suggesting that Parkinson's disease, maybe some other neurobiological diseases, are actually started by the conversation that the bacteria in our gut are having with our brain. And it would be nice to know about that because then hopefully we can figure out how to stop them saying the wrong things. Right, right, right. And, um, you know, I mean, a young boy from UK whose interest shifted uh, throughout his life initially trying to become a mathematician to a detective to a chemist. Uh, do you anticipate it that you would win a Nobel Prize? No, never. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really one of these things that it's not something you can make a, a goal in life. And it's actually not something you should ever make a goal in life because I can pretty much guarantee if you do, you'll be disappointed. And so it's much better just to accept it when it comes. Right. And how did you feel about it when you first uh, uh, were, you know, you came to know about that you would be awarded the Nobel Prize? Well, it, it's a, a, an interesting story. So we made the discovery in 1977 and the day we made the discovery, people in the afternoon were talking about Nobel Prizes. It, it was clear it was such a big thing. 
And within a week or two, people had discovered it everywhere because they already had the data in their notebooks and they'd not been able to interpret it until they think, you know, until we made the discovery. And so for a longest time, um, I think everybody was expecting that the Nobel Prize would head my way. Phil Sharp independently uh, made the discovery and he won all sorts of prizes, right, left and center. Um, and it wasn't until 1989 12 years later, um, and I'd not been asked, you know, I'd not been named on any of these prizes or nominated or anything else. It was not until 1989 that I discovered for the first time that maybe I would be nominated by Jim Watson, who was the head of Cold Spring Harbor at the time. And so in 1990, I was quite expecting to win. That was terrible. It, it really is better not to know um, because what happened. You know, in June, I'd already started preparing speeches and getting ready to accept the award because I figured the only reason I'd not got it was because I'd not been nominated. 1990, I didn't get it. That was unbelievably disappointing, uh, just incredible. The following year, I knew the same, but I waited until August before I started preparing the speeches and again was disappointed. And in 1992, I figured out that, you know, they just weren't going to give it to me. And so by 93, when I actually did win it, I'd forgotten all about it. And the phone call came in early in the morning and uh, it was pretty good. <laughs> right, right. Could you explain one of your Nobel Prize winning discoveries in a way that uh, someone without a scientific background could understand? Sure. Yeah, well, the, the way I like to think about it is if you're familiar with the way in which Hollywood filmmakers make movies. They, they shoot scenes and then they go to the editing room and they cut and splice that film so that when you look at it, it looks as though it's continuous action, even though it was made um, in a lot of different steps. And that's exactly what I discovered. That is how genes in higher organisms, this is how they make the messenger RNA that is ultimately going to code for the proteins. So they take a very long piece, a long string of RNA, and then cut it and splice it exactly the way a filmmaker cuts and splices his film in order to make something that is coherent at the end. And then the smaller piece of RNA that is composed of all these little bits and pieces goes to the ribosome and makes protein. And so the final steps are exactly the same as those in bacteria. It's this making of the messenger RNA in the first place um, that is very different. In bacteria, it's just a single piece of RNA. You make it, you translate it, you make protein. In higher organisms, you make a long piece of RNA, you cut and splice it just as the Hollywood editor does and then end up with this piece of RNA that could have come from a bacterium. Right, right. And is it true that all the information of any particular individual or uh, bacteria is inscribed within that gene itself, the way they evolve in the future? Within the DNA, yes. Uh, everything is in the DNA. And how do you maintain a balance between pursuing uh, groundbreaking research and ensuring its practical applications for the betterment of larger society? Right. Well, some people, you know, like to really focus on the applications. I'm much more interested in making the discoveries and then trying to explain it in the scientific literature and elsewhere so that people who want to take make use of it and perhaps apply it to medicine or anything else can do so. So I just inter I'm just interested in the, the basic research in finding new things, discovering new things, and then make sure those are available to the larger scientific community. So I leave it to someone else really to, to try and apply the discoveries that I made. What are some of the uh, biggest misconceptions that people have about medicines and their effect uh, on the body, uh, Rich? Um, well, I mean, I think one big misconception is that bacteria are not good for you. <laughs> that, that's really something that, that is a major misconception and it would be good if there were some better explanations from the journalists about that. Um, one of the big misconceptions at the moment concerns the origins of COVID and the thought that this came from a lab leak and was deliberately made. 
You know, there's simply no evidence for that whatsoever. And yet there are many people who believe that it was a deliberate act to make it and then it doesn't lift, you know, dropped out of the lab. All of the evidence is perfectly consistent with it being a natural virus that evolved out in the wild and then hopped over to, to people. And that's the way that most of these viruses come about. But, you know, unfortunately, the combination of conspiracists who would like to think that the Chinese are bad and others who, you know, just just love conspiracy theories and then spread them on social media. I think they do a lot of damage. They, they really are constantly trying to make a case that this was a lab leak, that it was something that was deliberately made at some point, when there's absolutely no evidence for that. Right, right. I mean, it was quite unfortunate when people went as far as claiming that, you know, through the injection of the COVID uh, uh, vaccine, there are certain things that um, you know, uh, information needs to be extracted. That's why those things were injected. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, the whole vaccine conspiracy theories are, are just crazy too. Vaccines are the very best medicine we've ever invented. We've never come up with anything better than vaccines. And then for people to start telling you how dangerous they are, it is, it is ridiculous. Some people do have side effects. There's no doubt about it. But the majority don't because the vaccines are tested quite carefully before ever they're put on the market. So they're, they're really good. Vaccines, we need to tell more people and persuade more people that vaccines are very good for you. Exactly. Rich, and in your opinion, what are the most exciting recent advancement in uh, molecular biology that have the potential to revolutionize medicine? Well, I think one thing that is has done really well is a program, a computer program called AlphaFold, which can predict how proteins fold. And that can really um, tell you quite a lot about what the protein's function might be. And I think we can look forward to future generations of AlphaFold in which we learn not only how to fold proteins, but what happens when they bind to small molecules, when they bind to a substrate. That, I think, is going to be very powerful. And artificial intelligence also has many ways in which it can help biology. But, but we have to be careful. I think it's not clear to me that we have the appropriate, um, shall we say, learning set that AI programs operate on. You know, by just taking something like chat GPT, which I call cheat GPT, but just taking that and giving it whatever Google can find on the internet, that's not a good way to do it. It would be much better if we had a really good factual database that we knew the information in it was as true as it could be from our perspective. Then I think we stand a great chance of really using AI to learn a lot of interesting facts about biology. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think that's good. But unfortunately, um, we need to make sure that we have a very good factual database underneath it. And it would also be good if the program told us how it was making um, the final summaries of what it does. You know, where if you ask it to do something and it produces a result, you would like to know how it reached that. And at the moment, the AI programmers haven't, haven't bothered to do that. They could do it, but they've not bothered to do it. And I think they need to do it. It's sort of like when we publish a scientific paper, and we include the methods uh, and the methods in general are methods that have been very well documented in the past so that we know how they work. Right. So if at all uh, there is a AI, the kind of AI that you are uh, talking about right now, factual based AI, what would its impact on, on the uh, uh, molecular biology itself? Well, I think one of the things it's going to do is to help us figure out what all the genes and gene products do. So, for instance, you know, we work because we make a lot of bodies, make a lot of proteins and they do all sorts of interesting things to make sure we stay alive. Sometimes things go wrong. And I think AI, once we know a great deal about how these proteins work, what they do, how they interact with one another, when things go wrong, AI will help to help us to understand why they've gone wrong and then give us some leads as to how we might correct it. Right.
Right. I mean, um, I'm not sure if this is directly related to your field, but do you feel that there's also a space for uh, natural products or traditional medicines that play uh, in modern pharmaceutical research and how um, can that be integrated into the mainstream healthcare practices? Because I ask this because, you know, uh, I was going through um, this book called Cancer, Curry and Me, written by uh, Subek Shagimire. Uh, she is herself for cancer survivor and uh, she has made it a point that, you know, there are a lot of things um, that the things that you consume does have a lot of impact on the um, kind of disease that we carry with ourselves. Yeah, well, for so sure, you know, the natural, so-called natural medicines, the Ayurvedic medicines and so on, all of these basically contain compounds, sometimes are good, sometimes not so good, sometimes they're neutral. And, but over, the over time, people were experimenting with these, discovered if they ate a lot of this, then it would be good for them. And if they ate a lot of something else, it was bad for them. And so a lot of natural knowledge accrued but it's all because of the compounds that are within these plants. And so one of the things that modern pharmacists like to do is to figure out what is the active ingredient in the plant, what is it that's good, and then just use that as the medicine. Whereas if you just wanna go back and say, well, we wanna eat the whole plant, you know, is one way to do it, but it's not going to have exactly the same nicely targeted effect that just consuming the active ingredient in that plant or ingredients in that plant. And a lot of people like to think that, well, you know, by doing it all naturally, somehow this is better. Um, but I, I think that's nonsense. It's not better to do it naturally. It's better to understand why these things work and then to be more precise in, you know, introducing the, the appropriate medicines. Right. And how do you think the advancement in, uh, in molecular biology might influence the future of um, personalized medicine and healthcare? Well, I think one of the things that's going on at the moment is that we're starting to recognize that very often when you have a disease, when things go wrong, it's just one or two cells that went astray. They went wrong, something happened to them, they picked up a mutation or they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, and then that expands and goes on. And in many cases, individual cells that cause the symptoms of a disease in one person um, don't cause that disease in another person or vice versa. And so we have to understand why some people are resistant to sort of the same stimulus, if you like, you know, the same cancer or, or whatever it is. And this will only come when we really understand all of the genes and what they do and how this affects things. And so I think personalized medicine means that one thing we want to do is to certainly understand the changes in the genome, the changes in the DNA in a cancer cell that is causing the problems. And then we can often find, well, here's a gene, it went wrong, um, but in another person it went wrong, but didn't cause the disease. Why didn't it cause the disease in the other person? Well, perhaps because they have some other genes that are protecting that were not present in the first person. And so this means understanding really the interaction of the genes and their products in a very detailed way, and then you can really have personalized medicine. But you don't have to know everything. You can, you can just know little bits and pieces. Um, we, as we go on, we will slowly find these little bits and pieces that can have an effect. And so personalized medicine will start off being fairly crude, but it can get better and better with time. And how do you think that advancements in molecular biology can contribute to addressing uh, pressing global challenges such as climate change or food security? Right, well, I've actually just been associated with a book um, that deals with some of these issues. Um, you know, I, I've been a big proponent for many years now of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, uh, because we know that many of the crops that we grow in, in countries, in the developing countries, have never been improved. The, you know, if you live in the West, you eat maize, you eat corn, you eat stuff that's really been tremendously improved by plant breeding. In the developing world, that's not taken place because the big agricultural companies 
felt they couldn't make any money there. So they never bothered trying to improve cassava or, or some of these other things that people eat. But we now know that very often there are good ways to improve these crops using genetic modification, using the products of modern biotechnology. And these are things that scientists in the country can do and can improve them. But what has happened is that in Europe, Greenpeace and a number of other organizations have come out heavily against genetically modified crops, not because they necessarily have shown them to be dangerous, because in fact, there's not been a single incident since in the last 30 years, since these things were developed, where you've seen a problem. But nevertheless, Greenpeace continue to push against them, stop them, try to stop them being grown, being used in the developing world. <clears throat> and they do it for the wrong reasons. You know, you want to know why people do things, they do things for money. And in the case of Greenpeace, their anti-GMO campaign has tripled their contributions from individuals and companies in Europe. So they've made a huge amount of money from this campaign. And I'm sure they're afraid that if they stop being against GMOs and admit that GMOs are good and safe, that their campaign contributions will go down and it will cost them money. So I, I, I'm very skeptical about all of this because everything that we've learned so far says that GMOs are safe. If ever, if anything, they're safer than traditionally bred crops because we know exactly what we've done to them. And yet Greenpeace won't admit this and they won't back down and say they were wrong. Right, right. So I think these are the ethical considerations that uh, uh, that one should take, uh, you know, and I think uh, researchers in working in molecular biology, biology and genetic engineering should also take some of the ethical considerations. Do you believe there are some important ethical considerations that needs to be taken into account? Well, I think with GMOs, the ethical considerations, the principal ones for me, are that if they're safe in, say, agriculture, which everything that we know at the moment says they're perfectly safe, we should say they're safe. But when it comes to humans and to making mutation, deliberate mutations in people or in some animals, uh, we need to think, what are the consequences? And I think for people... Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of parents say, oh, gosh, it would be really nice if my son was a foot taller than he is. And maybe we can figure out how to doctor an embryo. So the next child that comes along is going to be seven feet instead of six feet and a good basketball player. That sort of thing seems to me ridiculous. Uh, you know, ethically, I, I could not possibly think that that was a good thing. But if, on the other hand, we can change an embryo and introduce a mutation that will prevent them from getting sickle cell disease, that strikes me as being good. And so I think if we can use genetic modification of embryos in order to avoid disease and avert diseases, that we should do. That I think is reasonable. But we don't know how to do it precisely enough at the moment to guarantee that there are not going to be some unwanted consequences. So we need first of all, to make sure that the methods that we choose are much better than they currently are, that they're much more precise and we know that they're not going to cause problems. And then once we know how to do that, then we need to set rules and regulations about what's acceptable and what isn't uh, based on sound ethical principles. Right, right. And, uh, you know, how do you see the field of uh, the molecular biology itself evolving in the next decade and what implications it would have for the larger society? Well, I think one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to learn how to do things a lot better. Um, we're going to learn how to extract data from organisms, um, you know, how to find out how genes work and how proteins work and so on. There's going to be a much greater accumulation of knowledge, of precise knowledge, and that will be useful in telling us how organisms work and how the proteins and the RNAs and DNA, how they all interact with one another in better ways so that we will have a much clearer understanding. My hope is that before I die, we will actually understand how a bacterium works. And what I mean by that is that we could then write a computer program that would react to any external stimulus in exactly the way a bacterium would so that we have such a good model of how it works that we can write a program, uh, a computer program that will emulate it 
And then we can see, you know, instead of working on the bacterium, um, we can offer challenges to the computer program and see what happens. So, you know, I think something like that would be good. And eventually we would like to be able to do that for humans to know so well how they work that we can program, make a program that will exactly emulate what we will do. And then we can test would-be drugs on the computer program instead of on people. <laughs> it's, I mean, I really uh, want that, you know, the scientific fraternity comes up with these kind of uh, uh, innovations in the next decade and so and we wish you good luck for that. Really, thank you so much for your time. Despite your busy schedule, you came to my program. I'm really humbled and honored. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.